I want to take a look at the first of Marx's 1844 manuscripts, the first of his economic and philosophic manuscripts, which is called Estranged Labor. And that title is, of course, the concept that Marx wants to spend this entire manuscript working his way through, unpacking and uh, explaining to you. Now, at the very beginning of this first manuscript, Estranged Labor, Marx tells you that we are beginning from an economic fact. What does this mean? It means Marx is really going to be at great pains all throughout this manuscript to try to show you that he is not bringing in any kind of value system to judge or evaluate the situation. This is not a matter of capitalism is bad and so therefore these things are bad. This is not a matter of this is unjust. He's not going to say uh, that this is a matter of exploitation. This is simply a matter of looking at the situation of labor under capitalist relations, under contemporary economic relations, and looking at how it does function. There are two terms that Marx is going to use interchangeably here in the 1844 manuscripts, estranged and alienated, and fremdete and entreuselte. Now, what do either of these words mean? Well, estrangement is a making strange of some sort of a pre-existing relationship to take people who didn't used to be strangers and make them strangers to one another, for example. And so if you think about people you don't know, if, for example, there are uh, millions of people living in the state of Nebraska and you don't know any of them, they are strangers to you, but you are not estranged from them. You have no pre-existing relationship with them. On the other hand, if you have a wife or a brother or a father and you just no longer speak, you might be estranged from these people. There is some pre-existing relationship, but you have now become strangers to one another, or at least you now treat one another like strangers. And likewise, alienate is to shun or push away. It's to take something that is or was yours and uh, give it up or push it off. An alienable right, for example, is a right that you can give away or put over onto somebody else. And likewise, your group can alienate a member by simply shoving that person out, by shunning that person, by making that person go away. But again, things that you are separate from naturally or to begin with are not alienated from you. They were never yours. And so in both of these situations, we have a pre-existing relationship to which something has been done. And that is the German prefix ENT, enthauserte and entfremdete. Something has been done to something. And furthermore, just as alienated and estranged are both ending in ED, past tense, so too are the German terms that TE on the end is an indicator of past tense. And so what we have here is a relationship to which something has already been done. And so now, in order to think about alienated labor or estranged labor, we have to think about two things. First, a pre-existing relationship of some sort. And second, we have to think about what has happened to that relationship, what has been done, how this pre-existing relationship has been pulled apart, made strange, or uh, separated somehow. And so the first question we can ask here is, what does it mean to think of labor as a relationship that can be estranged or alienated? Well, what is labor? Labor is not just any activity, of course. Uh, a game of tag, for example, isn't labor, uh, even though you're spending lots of calories and tiring yourself out. Labor is productive activity. And productive activity is activity directed at producing some sort of a product, the product of labor. 
And so if that's the case, then automatically within labor, just to think about labor, we are already thinking about a relationship that you have with the object, the thing you are creating. And furthermore, that relationship as an activity is also something with which you can have a relationship. Humans are, after all, self-reflective. We are self-aware. We don't just do things. We are also aware of ourselves doing those things, and that's something separate that we can think about. And so, built right into the concept of labor is a series of relationships. And these relationships are where the estrangement happens, is where the alienation sets in. And that's what we can take a look at. And now furthermore, what is a product? A product is raw materials that you have labored upon in order to give them their finished form and shape. And so think about something like a vase. What's the difference between a vase and a lump of clay? Well, the only difference is a lump of clay that you work on for several hours then becomes a vase. And so that vase, in a very literal sense, is just the lump of clay, the raw materials, plus several hours of your activity. And because your activity is how you spend your life, we could even say that vase is just clay plus a piece of your life. And your life is you. And so, let's put it this way. A vase is just a lump of clay plus a piece of you. You put a piece of yourself into the things that you create. They contain a piece of your life within them, your labor. When the objects that you create are not yours, when they belong to someone else, when they are not yours even to begin with, then these pieces of you don't belong to you. You are estranged from yourself. You lose pieces of yourself through this process. Now I want to walk through the various moments of estrangement here, how these relationships get alienated or are alienated, and I want to do so using an example of a job that you actually like. Now trust me, when I was in college I had a, a lot of really part-time jobs, and I know full well that you uh, likely have some sort of a job that you don't particularly like. Uh, for example, I was uh, a barista at a coffee shop in college for a while, and I, I liked that job. I like making coffee. I love drinking coffee. I liked chatting with the customers. Uh, I liked my coworkers. This was really uh, a good job. But likewise, you may have even better jobs. Uh, you may work in a daycare and you just love kids. You may uh, work out on a, a farm somewhere and just really love the outdoors. You might work in a, a car shop and if you just really love cars, any of these situations, you may just really love your job. And whether you do or not, I want to just ask a series of questions. Now the first question in terms of thinking about labor is this. What is it that you produce in your job? Now already uh, for a number of you this is getting into weird territory because of course the service industry is fairly widespread at this point and a lot of us are no longer really engaged in producing anything at least no material physical object thing and so if you work at a daycare for example what do you produce well i guess you produce uh safe Happy children? Uh, if you work at a restaurant somewhere, what, what do you make? What do you produce? Well, and if customer satisfaction, people who uh, have eaten well. Uh, if you work at a bank, as a bank teller, what do you create or produce? Well, again, maybe sort of, I don't know, customer service and uh, satisfied 
customers. I think a lot of us, you just don't exactly create anything. And that's already something to think about. Where does that labor go? What are you putting that labor into? Well, that labor goes into other people who, at the end, just walk right out that door. They take your effort with them. You don't see the products of your labor. But likewise, some of you do produce things. Some of you do make physical objects at your job. And even there, here's what I want you to think about. The harder you work, the more of these objects exist in the world. And these objects are your objects. They would not exist if it were not for your labor. Objects don't just make themselves. Nothing will just assemble itself. You put in the labor, and that is why these things exist, at least in some way, shape, or form. But at the end of the day, how many of those objects do you take home with you? In other words, if you work to create five chairs at your job, or ten chairs at your job, or five hundred chairs at your job, how many chairs do you take home with you? And of course the answer, and I don't even know you or what your job is, but I can already guess the answer, is none. It doesn't matter how many things you create while you're at work, that's part of your job, and at the end of the day, you don't bring any of that home with you. Well, why not? Because, of course, you'll say you're taking a paycheck home instead. You get paid for your labor, uh, and you don't keep the various things that you make. Now, if you like your job, that is fantastic. And uh, the first question I want to ask you is this. If the boss called you up tomorrow and said, you know, we just love the work you're doing around here. You're doing a fantastic job, but we're not going to keep paying you for that work you do. Would you still show up? And most of you are going to say no. Even if you love your job, even if you really, really enjoy that work, you're not going to keep showing up for free. And why not? Well, because, of course, the reason you are doing that labor is to make the paycheck. And furthermore, even those of you who might be tempted to still show up, I suspect you would still have to go and get another job in order to make ends meet in the meantime. So what kind of a job do you need in order to earn a paycheck? Well, any job, of course. If you don't earn a paycheck, it's not a job. It's an internship, it's a hobby, it's a volunteer service opportunity, but it's, it's not a job. And so, of course, any job at all will get you a paycheck. It doesn't have to be this job. And so what we can see happening here is a series of what we can call estrangements or alienations within this natural relationship of labor. You have created an object. You have made some sort of a product. That product would not exist if it were not for you. And this goes for customer satisfaction, and this goes for making chairs, and this goes if you work at a cardboard box factory, or at a car factory, or a pizza place. The things that you create, you are there making them. They don't make themselves. They exist in the world because of you. And yet, your product is not yours. You do not keep that product. At the end of the day, your product belongs to somebody else. Your product is not yours. That is an estrangement. Now, second of all, we see an estrangement in the activity that you are engaged in to make that product. Because after all, the reason that your job exists in the world is not the reason that you have your job. Why does your job exist? Why do chair makers exist? 
Because we need chairs. Why do daycare workers exist? Because we need our children to be kept safe during the day. Why does a, a pizza parlor exist? Well, because people want to eat pizza. And yet, for every single one of these jobs, your reason for doing that labor is not because we need chairs or because we need safe children or because we like pizza. Your reason for doing that job is in order to earn a paycheck. And so your reason for doing this activity is not the reason this activity is done. There is some sort of a split happening in the why of your activity. And now following up on this why, of course, something else important is happening here. As a human being, you don't just do stuff. You don't just automatically do things. We don't wind you up. You don't act just on instinct. You do things because you decide to do them. Your actions are yours in as much as they are the products of your decision, your intentional decisions. And yet, when you go to work, who decides what you do? Are you the one deciding what you're going to do? You have a boss, a manager, someone telling you what you're going to do while you are at work. At the very least, you have a job description telling you what you are going to do while you are at work. Now, why do they get to tell you what you're doing? Because, of course, they're the ones paying you, right? This is what boss means. But now, of course, what this means for you is that your activity is not your activity. During the time while you were at work, your body is engaged in doing things that someone else has decided your body is going to do. Which is why, of course, one of the major metaphors that Marx will use for wage labor is going to be prostitution. You are renting out your body. You are selling your body for a certain amount of time while you are at work. And you're not sleeping with the people that you're working with, presumably, but what you are doing is just allowing someone else to decide what your body does for a couple of hours in exchange for the money that they are giving you. And so now what this means is that alienation, estrangement, is something happening within the labor relationship, whether you like your job or not. This is not a matter of you thinking that your job is meaningless, or that it's pointless, or hating your job, or feeling like your body's being destroyed by your work, or feeling like you get treated unfairly, or that you're being exploited. None of these evaluations has to be the case. This is an economic fact, Marx says. This is just what is happening when you are working and accepting a paycheck in exchange for the work you do and whatever it is you create does not belong to you. Now just by way of comparison, I want you to imagine a very different scenario. I want you to imagine you are walking through the woods and you find some pine cones. And you pick up those pine cones and whose pine cones are they? Well, they're yours now. Just your labor of picking them up off the ground, you have appropriated those pine cones from nature and made them yours through your labor. And of course, the harder you work, which is to say, the longer you walk through the woods picking up pine cones, the more you make, the more objects you get to take home with you. Those pine cones, through your labor, become yours, and the more labor you do, the more objects you have. Now take those pine cones home, pull out some glitter and some glue, go to town, and make glittery pine cone centerpieces. Whose centerpieces are they? Well, they are yours. You have put in the labor, you had the materials, every pine cone centerpiece you create is yours. You own it, and of course, it exists because of you. These two yours go together. And what can you do with these glittery pinecone centerpieces? Well, whatever you want. You could open up an Etsy store and sell your glittery pine cones. You could light them on fire and no one ever gets to see them. You could keep them in your room or on your mantelpiece. You could give them away as gifts to family and friends or strangers. You get to do whatever you want with them because they are yours. 
And so here we have a kind of unestranged labor. You put labor into an object, that object is still yours. It is your product and you own it. And so this object now just contains a piece of your labor and it is an extension of you. You retain ownership of the time and effort you put in to the object. Now you can take the pine cone centerpieces you've made and choose to sell them or choose not to sell them. If you sell them, of course, you get money in exchange for them. And so how is that any different than working a job where it's your job to make glittery pine cones, especially if you like that job? Well, here's the thing. When you're working a job, are you selling what you create to the company or to the boss at the end of the day? No, in a very important sense, you are not. You don't have these objects to set a price and sell. These objects were never yours to begin with. You put in the labor, but those objects were never yours. As opposed to if you are choosing to sell your glittery pinecone creations, these objects are yours until you sell them. And so these objects that you have made are yours. You retain control and possession of them until you choose to part with them. The objects you create at your job were never yours. These pieces of you, these bits of your labor, are automatically estranged within this process. Now remember, Mark says we are simply looking at an economic fact here. In working through the estrangement of labor, we are simply observing the situation of working in exchange for a paycheck. To say that labor is estranged is to say that this is what's going on, whether you like your job or not. But if that's the case, if there's estrangement and, or alienation within labor, whether you like your job or not, then where's the problem with estrangement? And after all, I think this is probably why most of the explanations you're going to get online of alienated labor focus so much on factory workers who hate their jobs, because now it looks like it's a problem. You might say, well, if I can like my estranged job, then where's the problem? And Marx wants to show you where the problem is. But in order to do that, he says, we're going to have to derive new features. We're going to have to go beyond the surface. We're going to have to start with what we've observed and then keep unpacking this conceptually. And in order to do that, he's going to have to take a detour through philosophical anthropology. And that's exactly where the concept of species being is going to come in.